Daddy was a preacher, Mama was a lever. They both raised me to believe. Uh, so then you're opening for guys like Alan Jackson. Now, not that I, I don't know exactly what's happening in the Alan Jackson camp, but there must have been some of the trappings of the music business, i.e. women, potentially drugs and alcohol. How do you separate yourself or is there a struggle to separate yourself from that? Or has it now just become so natural that you can coexist with that and not have it pull you? I'd say the latter. It's it's easy now. It's easy now to, to coexist with it and not have it pull you where you don't want it to pull you. Um, I remember a bunch a uh, bunch of years ago, maybe it's only 2013, 20, yeah, 2013, uh, we were out doing the Calgary Stampede and um, the other artists that we were hanging out with, we... Uh, there was there was a situation where you know a bunch of girls are hanging around one of the guys and and my, my drummer and somebody else looked at me and he says we don't really roll like that and then they're pointing at me like you don't really roll like that and i'm like it just it, it doesn't incur like that happens there and it doesn't necessarily like you don't cool. you don't necessarily need it at the front of the thing and so to to be able to separate it it's not always been easy to, to separate it because you get a little yeah. confused yeah but when you do it's a really neat kind of it's a it's an empowering thing you know you're not you're not a sucker for it yeah. let's put it that way you're cool man <laughs> this is awesome well, you're cool with it <laughs> no. yeah before and we will move on from you know the childhood in the life of with your parents but i, I do have to touch on this have they ever been to a marshall dane show oh yeah man so tell me That's about the first time awesome. You convinced them or how that actually worked that there they were not only being okay with what you were doing, but being in the audience and seeing you live. Well, sometimes I do things at a shock value just because I, I know that they're watching. <laughs> what? And, and by that, I mean like, you know, daddy was a preacher. Mama was a lever. And they're like, what is he talking about? Or, you know, Mama gave her life to the preaching, or Daddy gave his life to the preaching, but he couldn't hide the devil in his eye, you know, and then they watch me. Um, it's, okay. It's, it's a little bit of a, you, you were know. grounded. Yeah, it's kind of like that. Um, you know what? They're, again, they've they've gotten over the, 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 the problem with it. And not that there ever was a problem because they love music so much that when they watch it, they're, of course, they're moved and they're, they're just as moved as I am with it. But um, they now, they embrace it. Like my father, a lot of times I'll sing lyrics and the people beside him will be like, what is, what does your son mean by that? And he's like, I don't know. I think he's making that stuff up. You know, yeah. And but you know, and they're referring to he well, just said something about his dad. And he's like, I don't know. He's my kid. He just says stuff. <laughs> you know, I don't want to get you all emotional, but that's got to mean so much to you, because every child wants their parents' approval in whatever they do, and I would think to look out and see them there and not have this look of disdain on their face and looking at their watch or yawning or saying we're getting out of here. I mean, how did that touch you when, when you looked out and you saw them there? It brings you to tears. Yeah. It, um, this last summer, my mother has not been out to a show for a long time. And it's just because we don't do shows in the Southern Niagara region. And that's where she's based out of. And she's not able to travel too easily. So um, when I finally got a show out of Hamilton area, I, and I got a couple of hotels for the band for the night, I was like, I'm going to hook up my mom. We're going to get a place out here. We'll just get her out. She came out. They set up a lawn chair for her side stage to watch the show. She was out in the audience because she wanted to watch the show. And then she came side stage. I had just, um, oh, you're going to get me going. I had just decided to sing a song that I had just written that I was getting ready to release, which is something that I was, I'm, I'm working on right now. And it's a tune all about my mom. She raised eight children. Wow. And she did it 90% of it by herself. I don't know how she had one income and managed to break that bread into enough to feed all the kids and still have a little, you know, and still have something left over to, to the next day. Um, so this, this tune is, it's called, uh, it's, it's, uh, um, it's called man of the house. And it's basically how she finally had to leave the house in the middle of the night one time. And she took me and my four sisters at the time. That's, that's all there was at the moment. And she left the house and it was just me and girls. 
And she's wow. like, love is oh, all. Dude, you're going to make me cry, dude, man. She's like, love is all that matters in the end. And then we left. And it was at that point where I was just like, huh, I guess I'm the only guy left. And so that's now inspired the tune going Whoa. forward. Yeah. So my mom heard that song for the first time this last summer. And it was hard to even break through the tune. Even the guys in my band are like, how is he going to get through this? Jeez. And, you know, you're sitting there. And even, like, there's one part of the song where it goes, my mama said, now you're the man of the house. Like a big kind of yeah. choir thing at choir, the end. gospel And you can deal. feel my boys jumping in to sing the background. And me, my voice is cracking. But they're strong, like little pillars on either side. It's really cool. I mean, oh my god. Okay, yeah. but <laughs> well, that's the stuff. That's so, why so we well, do it. Well, Matt takes a deep breath and tries to gather himself. <laughs> yeah. That's a crier, you know. This, yeah, it's cool. Uh, 2017 and, and 2018 have been very, uh, very good years for you. Uh, you've really started to even take even bigger leaps. You were up for a country music award. How has this last year or so been for you on a professional level? Because country seems to, it's really weird because you have that group of country fans that will always be there and you have pockets of the world that are always going to be country. But when it comes to the mainstream, it kind of goes up and down and up and down. And it appears as though country's kind of getting back into the mainstream. Yeah, the ebb and the flow of any of the genres, you really kind of like they always say, you just kind of have to stick to what you do. And the... The reason for that is because at the end of the day, you're the person that likes it so much to the point where you love it so much that your your anger and your love turns into the passion for it so much that you do it the most. And so no matter when it's bad or when it's good, you're still enjoying the push of it towards the wall. And if you wait long enough, either A, it, it always is enjoyable because you don't mind the push because you're someone who loves it, or it comes around and it's actually your turn and you're still pushing it. It's like, wait, you guys like rock music again? Hey, hey, I do rock music. Finally, it's my turn. And next thing you know, you're a Nickelback. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay, that, interesting comparison. <laughs> that went off uh, off the rails you, quick. You, you <laughs> literally could do a Nickelback tribute with that hair. Right, you know? Yeah. So, so then what's the end game? Like, is it that you would like worldwide fame? Is it financial stability? Is it pouring my heart out and fulfilling my creative needs? What's the end game? Is it yes to all of those things? No. Um, oh, okay. I like no. <laughs> Big fan of no. And I say no because fame and making it isn't the end game. It's never been the end game for me. I never had... I just wanted to get out of the the, the rut of the weird thing I felt like I was tied into as a child you know the religious yeah. confines that was really the, the end game was just to get out and find out what it was that I wanted but so now that you have that you've got the carrot bro well so that's kind of it like the end game <laughs> is it like or is it right now um, and by that I just mean I figured out that I like working hard already I don't want to sign to somebody else to have them do the job for me I want to do the job I want to work hard at it I want to build it um, if other people want to come along and help build it too that's great um, the joy is in the in the building and seeing the successes like this last year this last year and a half has seen certain things become really good like the blue you know we had a great blue rodeo show last year we had great nominations last year we had all kinds of great award stuff um we had great show uh festivals and opportunities and events and yet there's there's the stuff that i'm working on behind the scenes like barry and i know this last year we've done a lot of video work it's like that kind of stuff when that stuff surfaces that's going to be exciting for me because i know i've really been a part of all of it nobody else has done it for me it's been me trying to navigate it and if it wins i'm joyful in the win if it loses what did it lose it didn't lose anything it doesn't lose any it just it just doesn't make it super famous but that's fine that's another version of in the bubble i kind of think and if you get that then you have to be under the trap of now you're in the bubble and if you're really good you're going to be in the bubble hardcore because the bubble wants to make money from you whereas I kind of like the balance of uh, of trying really, really hard, working really, really hard, having a couple of days off, doing some of this stuff. Yeah. You know, like there's a balance here where I think this is this is a good end. But there has to be some part of you that says this would be great when it becomes, or if it, or if it already is, financially 
stable. Where and it going begins to that to one, pay, yes. Yeah, where it begins 100%. to pay for itself, right? Yes. Where now you're not, not even making money, but having it support itself. So this is now a supportable entity. Right. And, and again, this business is full of surprises. And one thing I've learned even recently, and I mean recently as of in the last five days, there are things that happen behind the scenes in the music business. When you're struggling, you're trying really, really hard, and you're praying for just a sign. Please give me something that says there's something going on. And it's not just always if I swing the hammer, the nail goes in a little bit further. Tell me there's somebody else on the other side of the world that says, you want that nail to go in a little bit further? I'm going to send him a special nail. It'll go all over. Like, tell me somebody cares. And sure enough, you know, there was something I found out about uh, something that's been going on in Europe with a couple of my tracks. No way. I didn't know. It's been two years. Almost. Two Kidding. Years. That's in fa- that's Dude. So are, are you going to go out there and do some shows? No, it has nothing to do with me. What? It just has, it has everything to do with the songs. It has everything to do with that's the songwriting. Fantastic. And stuff man. that you would never even know. There's no agent, there's nobody that's calling me up saying, hey, you know what the good news is? You just have to wait. And I was, I'm just on the edge of not giving up, but you're on the edge of everything. Sure. You're like, ah. What do I do? And then finally one day you're like, there's nothing and I'm busting. And then you get something and you're like, what's that? And you're like, that's some information about something that's going on. And you're like, whoa, I wasn't even working that. What is that? And you're like, somebody else is working some magic. There's something else happening. And it's that's like, incredible. Yeah. Like it's those little moments where you're like, ah, that's, that's enough. You know, like you yeah. want more of that. Yeah. Now, and, you know, that's, that's where you become addicted. To I got to tell you something. Your dad wanted you to be a preacher. Mm. You're a preacher. I know, man. You know what I'm saying? I was say, like you may not you can't be, run from you, it, man. You, you may not be in a church preaching religion, but you are preaching your story. You're preaching with your music, and just to hear you talk, my and it's, man, that's incredible, Holy bro. Cow. That was just a sermon. You just sermon. You just gave I'm, a sermon. Wow, you did. I'm humbled by that. This is the this is the stuff where if somebody's struggling, they're gonna go listen to that and go, yeah, but this guy's struggling too, and you're not even talking about God. You're just talking about spirituality and and you know hanging on and believing yeah dude not giving up all that kind of stuff and you know i i'm even listening to what you say and thinking about my career path and where things have gone for me and where i hope they go and just listening to you going wow all of a sudden i feel a lot better about about where things are heading something's happening in europe you better check (laughs) yeah (laughs) check my emails right now all right listen you're going to perform a song for us but before you do Matt, you were already in studio doing some work here when Marshall pulled in, and I saw his van, and I'd seen it once before. How I forgot, I don't know, but he has curtains all around the van, and all on the curtains were M&Ms. Here's your phone, Marshall, and for those that can see the video, um, while there is an M&M cover what can you explain your obsession with the m&ms and are they red m&ms like van ask, halen are, are they, they any, on your riders when you play shows rider story there's got to be something to the m&m thing i you know it's funny is i'm not even embarrassed about it but yeah well i it, hope not you got all over your bloody vehicle yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. if you were embarrassed you wouldn't be advertising <laughs> your obsession i'm really yeah um so no, you've got the obsession word kind of down right. Um, Is it OCD it, level? It's it's a gift. <laughs> okay. uh, so anyway, here's the thing, and I'm sure this is a study unto itself. Um, when I was a young child growing up in St. Catharines, I remember going to Joseph's Barber, which was in the same plaza as the Five and Ten, the Five and Dime. Yep. Which every time I hear the Johnny Mellencamp song, I'm like Five and Dime, we got one of those, and a Tasty Freeze in the Tobacco. Um, <laughs> Anyway, but right beside the Five and Dime was uh, Joseph's Hair Salon, or hair place, whatever. And aside from having quarters glued to the floor, which always irritated me because I'd reach for them, um, he had this red M&M guy, this dispenser. You'd pull down the one arm, and out of the other arm would shoot a peanut M&M. And he'd let me do it like once, maybe twice, because a couple come out at a time. You weren't allowed to take too many. But I always just wanted the M&M guy. I just wanted it. And as a kid, there were so many kids in our family and there was like here's a little story to take with you and i'm not going to i'm not going to start off we were so poor that but when there's this many kids when there's seven children the majority of the time and a single mother the majority of the time you don't get at the t- when there was a cabbage patch doll okay this is going to date it a little bit but there was a thing called cabbage patch dolls absolutely yeah we got patch dolls cabbage patch dolls all got different names 
I got patch dolls, which all had the same name. So my sisters all had the same girl doll. I, like, anyways, so that was the big rave at the time. So the point I'm getting at is that we didn't get toys the same way other people got toys. We didn't do Christmas the same way, like all that stuff. Yeah. So toys were such a rarity that when I saw this M&M guy, I was like, I want this M&M so bad. But of course the answer was no. And so fast forward, I've now, I've left the family. I've left the, the church. I'm living on my own. I'm selling art out of the trunk of my car. I'm somewhere in like Fergus, Ontario. I'm driving by a co-op farmer's market and I'm trying to sell the art from my trunk to anybody. And I'm like, you want to buy a piece of art? I got this this painting. I'll sell it to you. It's like probably worth a hundred bucks. I'll sell it to you like 40. And of course, I mean, that's just like the worst lie. I got this. I'm not selling nothing. And this lady says, "I'll maybe I'll take it. Anyways, I finally see in this farmer's co-op, uh, co-op two M&Ms they want it for 10 bucks each there's the red guy with his arm just like the one I saw at Joseph's Barber and there's a bubblegum machine one with just a little M&M thing on the front and I was like I'll give you the art that I have here these two pieces for free I just want those two things fast forward a couple of years because that was <clears throat> only a few years ago fast forward a few years I now have a crazy kind of obsession with how happy and positive these little M&Ms are. I mean, they're not children, don't get me wrong, but I've got so many of them that I have a, I have a room dedicated to uh, M&M things. It's just ridiculous. And, and I've collected them over the years, so people, even fans, come out to shows now, and they're like, do you have this one? And I'm like, how did you get a kite? And even though they made a kite. Yeah. I don't know if you've already done this, and if you haven't, uh, I'm giving you the idea right now. A metaphorical song written about M&Ms. It doesn't have to be directly. It doesn't have to be the Eminem man. You, you could call it the Eminem man, but I'm thinking something metaphorical. <laughs> the wheels are now turning. Oh, no, I, got, oh boy. I got the wrong wheel turning. <laughs> right. Uh, thanks a bunch for sharing the story. It, it, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on and sharing it. Where can folks see you perform and uh, plug your website and anything else that you can plug so people can uh, find your music? Okay, well, I, I'm going to say the best place to find my music is marshalldane.com um, slash music if you want to go that far. And the reason I say that is because you don't have to have a, a membership monthly unless you're on Apple Music or if you're on Spotify. If you don't have those things, you can listen to my tracks right from a website. Um, we have videos up there which are indie videos that we've shot all throughout the GTA which are kind of fun because you can see everything from a $100 video to a, a, a $1,200 or $12,000 video. Um, I think it's about the max we spent. Um, and, uh, but all the music can be found there. And yeah, I'd say if you're on social medias, Instagram and Facebook.com slash Marshall Dane Music. Uh, I've got a personal page, but it really doesn't get activated as much as the uh, music page does. So please come join me there. And that's where I would be posting any new and upcoming information. This year is going to see the, the beginning of all the stuff that I've been quietly and, and progressively working on in the background, which is s s new, uh, new singles with videos at the same time being released um, and having them in conjunction one after the other, which is a, a tall order for an independent little team to do, but we're getting it together. So yeah, keep, uh, keep with us on social media and the website directly. And we can also, there's actually a free download of Motorcycle and Crying Over, which are uh, two tracks that I didn't know were doing so well over in Europe at the moment. Sneaking across the border, trying to find quarters on the floor for gasoline. Mama crying in the front seat.